You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. God bless you, brothers and sisters, seekers of the Christ. This is Romal Simeon, author of the Lecture Divina, the Meditations on the Scriptures, the, God, the Books of John, the Gospels, the Letters, and Book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And trying to explain things to you. And boy, do we have a, a session tonight. This is Book of Revelation from chapter 5 to 11. I'll try to summarize these chapters because I say this is a tighten your seatbelt conference because there is just so much to say. I've got not only the book of Revelation, which to get the whole meaning of it, you have to read those chapters in this book as explained and described in uh, detail. But my summary now is a Revelation and Apocalypse. You know, the two words are used for this book. Revelation and Apocalypse. And Apocalypse is sort of the understanding the negative elements, the frightening things, the diabolical, the human uh, idolatry against God, and the battle that goes on between good and evil in our souls, in our lives, in our ambience, in our cultures. And that's what we talk about today. And, but Apocalypse is actually only a Greek translation of the word Revelation. It's a revelation, but it has a uh, negative uh, aspect to it. And so we're going to, it, it may seem, some parts may fe seem confusing, some parts may seem very enlightening, but whatever it is, it is very important in our lives. So I'm giving a summary of six chapters. So let's see how far we can go and how far we can understand it. And I think here, if you call in on the uh, website to Romal Simeon to answer any specific questions on it. I think it's going to be very exciting. For me it is. It's a, It's like... Parts of it are just like a going through the uh, fields of Elysian, you know, just everything, light and God revealing himself to us in a delightful way. But most of it is like a merry-go-round. It's like a, a combination merry-go-round and a roller coaster and a, a storm at sea. It's just about every uh, metaphor you can use of things that sound disturbing. And we try to see, get through it. All the moments that we're strapped in here, we're strapped in the, in the bounds of Jesus. We have one goal. One, uh, He wants us to see what we're going through, what we're tumbling through, and what we're gliding through in life. It's all this mismatch. So, this is the Divine Lamb, the Divine Father's plan. But it's not the plan of Elysium, of comfort, of the... It prepares us for the final day. It prepares us for heaven as be in the family of God. The time of happiness is at the end. So, this is the program of Earth's existence of good and evil. And how to relate and react. How do we choose? And how do we lose? How do we win? How do we lose? Choose. It's like a gamble of life, but it's not exactly a gamble because there is control 
of Jesus Christ and there is the opposite action of human beings connected to the seven capital sins. We'll be talking a lot about seven capital sins. But this is an event that we see of how to live our human history, our individual history, and what's going on around us. So here comes in chapters 5 to 11 the confusing and not the amusing but the comforting. The good and the bad, revelations and apocalypse. It's exciting, disturbing. It's wonderful, praiseworthy, thanking God and understanding God and calling out to God. He, this is the time to call out to God, to know who we are and who He is and how He is our Father. Jesus is our brother. The Holy Spirit is our enlightenment. So, prepare now for an exciting mishmash of human history of every type of good, evil, tragic, catastrophic, diabolical, and metaphors symbolizing what we're going to go through. Our souls are going to go through this. Our lives go through this in a way. Some say, well, you know, life is, is hellish. Well, not just hellish, it's also purgatorious. It pur purges us from evil, and it's also, at times, heavenly. We have all this in life. Now, God defends us and he vindicates us. So we say, that's the seatbelt holding us in. We know that whatever happens, we're in the hands of God. It's not a seatbelt. It's the hands of God so around us, holding us, petting us, encouraging us, strengthening us. But in fine, we come to a final victory and vindication. So, some people think that is uh, Christians too. They read the Apocalypse or the Book of Revelation and hear all these things. It's terrifying. Yes, there's terrifying moments. But we're still in the sea. We're still in with Jesus. And we know that it's the end, like a uh, terrible. <laughs> To me, it's terrible. The, the seatbelt ride of a of a you know a whole roller coaster. You know, they said that when I was before I was born, my mother was uh, excited. She was about she was thirty years old. But she still liked to ride the roller coasters in Chicago. And maybe that was frightened me because I can't ride roller coasters. <laughs> I don't, I have, I know I'm not going to fall out. I'm going to hang in there. But it's a terrifying thing for me. And sometimes life is that way. That sometimes it's terrifying. But whatever it is, we're safe. We're in the seat with Jesus Christ. He's holding us. So, we're going to talk about serious, so we have a series of relapses and advances in life. We're going to talk about something of our culture. In everyone's life, one thing we should have even you know, on our heads, carved in stone, and sometimes our heads are stone. The carved in stone, certain words, one is history repeats itself. Human history, human cultures, 
repeat itself. You look into it, that's why we should study history. Um, I am an historian, taught history, and I have I notice in today's culture whoever I meet don't seem to know history. They don't seem to know that whatever you're talking about in the daily news is a repetition of something that happened before. Good and bad. It's a repetition with different names, different places, and different people involved. It seems to be different issues, but there are no different issues. There are no different issues. The same issues are happening all the time. Each human generation is always saying, oh, it's going to get better. Or if you're older, like myself, you say, gee, it was better before when it was bad. We thought it was bad. At the time of the Depression, I'm dating 95 years old. I was raised in the, in the American Depression of the 1930s. I'm 28 on. Um, but, hey, things are pretty bad now. But, you see, oh, but they were better before, before I was born in the, in the Roaring Twenties. And they were worse in the generation before that, in the ten years before that, in World War I. And then, when we're going out of the Depression, trying to get out of the Depression, we end up in World War II. So we're going in and out all the time. It's like a, uh, a raft ride down a river. You have the smooth parts, and then you've got the rapids. Then you got a waterfall. It looks like everything is a disaster. That's how it is in life. And if you look at every page, I have a book where it shows a thousand years history page by page by page and so there's over a thousand, two, about 2,000 pages in it and it gives summary of each era and it's all that repetition different names, different faces, different places and it happens in one place after another around the world in all different countries it's like I think it was sometimes like a poker game. Some uh, some are winning, some are losing. Some are winning, some are losing. Fate changes. Situations seem to change, but when you come down to it, it's a repetition of the same issues over and over again in a different ambience. People come to our country because they're trying to escape from another country. Then our country gets bad and they want to go to the other places. They want to go back home. They want to go to another place that's more peaceful. We have times of sickness. We have times of disease. We have times of prosperity. That is how it works. History repeats itself. And so I'm saying to the persons who are listening here, this is what we're talking about in the Apocalypse. It shows the good and the bad. How one thing goes almost impossible to recover from, and the Lord rescues us, and then we leave him, or we do not do what he commands or suggests or models, it goes back and back and back again. And I call this now, I will call this specifically, like the heading of a chapter, the application and the misapplication and the reapplication and the opposition to the seven capital sins. I call them plagues. I'll repeat that infinitum to you. Plagues, P-L-A-G-G-E-S. I'm spelling it my way. 
pride, lust, anger, greed, gluttony, envy, and sloth. There we are. I repeat this many times in the different videos. You can go back to them and forward to them. You read them in the scripture. The seven capital sins. The seven areas of our sinfulness. Of our destruction. And not only are they of our destruction, but they create destruction when we seek those in the improper way, in the immoral, sinful, vice way. I say, we say, wish us. Well, it's vices too. V-I-C-E-S, as vices. The opposite of them are virtues, are positives, are things that go right. So in other words, for each one, if you have a pride, which means idolatry in the, in the sinful way, that we are God and we correct God. We ignore God. We are God in our local way, that we make ourselves uh, our own little kingdoms and we try to rule that kingdom as a god. We have vices. We say, oh, if you rule a kingdom, you have to control others. See? And that is what kingdoms are. Whether it's yourself, your family, your community, even your church, or a nation. It all is basically the same pattern. It's a pattern of control and subjugation or freedom and acceptance. So, new people, the point is then, the application of civil capital sins, that new people and the new generation, and people say, I was talking to my doctor the other day, and he says, well, new generation every century. I said, well, it comes down to every lifetime. And if you really want to get to it, about every 10 years, because there's fluctuation. It, it's in flow. Cultures are in flow. Yeah, that's the point. Here I'm 90 years old. The people down below 90 that are in my generation are not understood by people of the present generation. Like every 10 years. Does a 10-year-old understand a 20-year-old? Does a 20-year-old understand a 10-year-old? Even though he went through it. Does he understand the ones he didn't go through yet? Does he understand the 60-year-old? So, new people are always seeing things in a different way have a different perspective. And they overturn the people before and hope for, always hoping for better. But even the people behind us in a different, in a generation just moving are saying, oh, that's pretty bad. It, it, humanity is, is not balanced. They talk about peace, peace, but there is no peace. Each one has their own self-interest. And that's key. That's key and we're going to that. we we'll talk about that. So people get activated to do things and then they seek help with those who are seeking to, to do things and to make things better. And as people are making things better, the same people who are trying to make things better are making things worse against the people that are trying to, to make things better. Now, isn't that confusing? So, well, we live in a peaceful time. We're living in a momentary setback, a moment of relaxation between uh, 
one catastrophe in another, one war in another. What is peace? Peace is the small time between one war and another, one catastrophe and another. You say, well, why can't people get along? Exactly why. They have different perspectives, different self-interests. And the different self-interests, when you come down to it, are the same self-interests that the people who want peace have, but in a different way. Some want it in a positive way, some want it in, into a negative way. And that's the issue with the human race. Whatever is, is always being overturned by something who wants a future is, and are not happy with the present is. And the ones who are happy with the present is, are trying to hang on to it. Don't want the others to do it. It's not just in the area of politics. It's actually in the area of human existence. And we have an element of solidity, of unity in our essence. We all want peace. We all want to get along. We all want to love each other. We all want to have everybody do their own business. And we want everybody to be happy. On the other hand, everything that we do to do accomplish all these things conflict with other people are trying to do the same thing. Then there are people that we see are not doing the same thing. Cultures are not doing the same thing. People are also territorial. Nations are territorial. Nations that are allies in one generation are enemies in the other generation. Then the ally to allies to people to help them overcome the people that they are trying to control and your ally in the next generation becomes your enemy and you have to get to the other ones to control them. It's always mixing up. It's all a mess of confusion. Everyone trying to get a position, trying to get a peace, but in trying to get peace, they're also trying to get a piece of you. So, human cultures are always in flux. They're always in flux everywhere. They're never stabilized. You want them to be stabilized, they're stabilized for a moment or two. For a few years. Just like your families are stabilized and relationships are stabilized. Let's talk about relationships and how we have to have relationships and you have to have psychologists figuring out how to have a happy relationship with everything it's all the same thing one answer and one answer creates new problems it creates new problems for for the others that take the problem away from you well you see what a conflict is we need something that is ultimately stable. So we always look forward to the nirvana. We always look forward to the next world. We always look forward to heaven. Make things heavenly. Make things comfortable. Make things happy. Because there are no conflicts. But even that, we try to reach that, creates a conflict in this world with others. There is no peace under the sun. So, what do the seven capital sins do? What are, and what are human cultures? Human cultures are men's recreation of God's creation. 
I'll repeat that. Human cultures are humans' recreation of God's creation. We have, with God, with Jesus Christ, we have stability. It tells us how to live, how to be, how to behave. But that isn't satisfactory with human free will. And it, it, it's whatever is a culture in our country, in our local situation, not just our country, in our community. in our nation, in our state. And the same thing is happening in other people's country. They're all seeking happiness, all are seeking peace, universal needs of every human being. But the ones, the way that people apply it, differ. The specifics the way that we move in relationship to one to the other is always some mishmash, some confusion, something that is moldering and smoldering and, and or we say growing and developing. The pre predominant Occupation responsibility of Earth, people on Earth, their home, which is temporary. We're only here for a short time in life. And we're trying to make sense out of it. And seven capital sins we find out are also self-interest rules. Jesus says to us when he shows his model, love one another as I have loved you, as God loves. With equality, with affirmation, with interest, with even when things go wrong, with forgiveness, with assistance, grace. We need God. We need help. We can't do it alone with good relationship with God and with men. But everything that comes with a self-interest is, oh, I can handle it. I can do it myself. I'm an island. I'm independent. Everybody's got to do it my way. Everybody's got to conform to me. So we make ourselves an idol to people around us. And we do this even to ourselves. We don't know when we have achieved peace even within ourselves. If we were hermits, we wouldn't be able to know what was a good day or a bad day. And sometimes we have a hermit attitude. We only could go back into our shell like a turtle and live our own life and not be susceptible to others. To avoid attacks, everything will go good. Now that's what we're talking about in the book of the Apocalypse. In chapter 6, we have something that everybody knows or heard about and maybe some some way of a story. The four horsemen. God reveals to us the scroll of the four horsemen that come into our lives. Now I'll just say them easily so you can remember that the four horsemen 
is the white stallion, the brown stallion or the red stallion, the black stallion, and the pale stallion. People worry about the pale stallion that comes into people's lives. He's the controller. The white stallion is God. White stallion is Jesus Christ. It is the just judge, warrior, who tries to bring peace, but he's got a two-edged sword. He has to cut away and defend the good against the evil, and he has to make things easier and give victory to the people that are good. That's what we seek. You have the red stallion or chestnut brown stallion, which is havoc, confusion. That's the historical culture. Brings confusion. Whatever seems to be good, he turns into bad. Then the good resent the bad and overthrow the bad by being bad. It's like a war. The bad are attacking and lose the peace and we're afraid to get killed, we're afraid to over be overrun. The Spain is being destroyed, so we turn around and kill and destroy the ones who are attacking us as aggressors. So the victims have to become uh, your victim, and you have to turn the other people into victims. There's no end to it. Confusion, havoc. The black stallion. The black stallion is the balance. Is a balance in life. We fulfill our destinies. We're on a scale. We're on a scale. We have to answer to someone to know whether we're down on the scale or up on the scale. Down or up. Down or up. And it keeps going around that way. That's the black standard. Because we don't, we're like in the dark. We don't know where we are. Are we secure or insecure? What is making us insecure? I go to bed secure and happy. I get a nightmare. Other things come back in my life that were I made mistakes. And not only mistakes, but mistakes that were deliberate and hurt us. Disturbs me. I wake up. Not happy. Put that aside. Try to control it. Go and pray to the Lord. Say, Lord, forgive me. I say sometimes, I say, Lord, I know that sometimes I acted like a devil. I acted like the very people that hurt me and I hurt them back. But Lord, I want to be that devil who rebels against the devil. I want to be good with you. I want to follow your way. Help me today. Help me today. To do it the right way. Not just to seek my own good ends, but to apply that and share it with others. Help them who are confused to get unconfused. Put them back in the balance. And that's what you do to us. You put us back into the balance and balance things out. But then we have the pale stallion. The death. Death. The one who comes to destroy everything. See? See? He doesn't have any good in him. Every time you ask him for help with your seven capital sins, 
and he promises something, it's a lie. Promises, oh, if you greed, if you get enough wealth, you can control everybody around you and control the politics of the nation, or you can control your family, or you can control your business, that you're going to be happy. Well, you can sit in a pile of gold, it can get very uncomfortable. You see how many people suffer because you have their gold. You've used them, you've enslaved them, and they are envious of you. Mig say, okay, you'll be the headmaster of the school, you be the head at the table, at the banquet of recognition, you be the one proclaimed in newspapers, but you're like the rest of them. You've got your own problems, and as many people are you are exposed to, as many friends as you make, as many as you expose yourself to, you're also exposing yourself to those that dislike you, are offended by you, and envy you. So where does it go? You only can return to a father who understands all of us, who gives equal love to all of us, who gives equal peace to all of us, gives equal forgiveness to all of us. The only way that we can have peace is to have in ourselves the attributes, the attitudes, the actions of Jesus Christ. He came to show us the attributes of God. And when we show those attributes, no matter how good we are, no matter how much we try, there are those that are going to oppose it. So only in heaven is there peace. Only time that is the time of victory, of daily victory. Say when the different seals that are opened up in the scroll of humanity's reality and these chapters read these chapters 5 to 11 and see where you fit with each section of it. and in chapter 7 it talks about the seal of vindication those who witness for the Lord. That the Lord, the white stallion, vindicates the individual, the innocents, those who are truly innocent. And the area in which each person who was guilty of something was innocent. If we come to a final characteristic that we have in life the ultimate one, those that die for Jesus, who die for righteousness the martyr you say they go straight to heaven, there's no purgatory for them, there's no they had their punishment on earth they suffered injustice and they will be vindicated they're they are culturally condemned. Look at each martyr. They're condemned to death by their culture. Their dehumanized culture. The dehumanizing culture. The seven capital culture. The violent culture. The greedy culture. The slothful culture. The one that doesn't care what's happening to anyone around them. Those that are backstabbed, those that are lied about, those that are misinterpreted, again, 
when they're doing right. Reputations that are constantly attacked. We have even, if we, when we go to school, the ins and the outs. We have those that are ignored. Those that are considered nobodies. We use fancy words for it, the disenfranchised. The no-named mass of people, the uneven, the useless, the defectives. So, but what if we are innocent and we are in virtue and we oppose the seven capital sins and we work against them? were signed and enfranchised and branded God's own. You belong to God. There's a brand on your forehead. Part of the scripture, it talks about the diamond, the white stone, the sign of God, God's seal that he puts onto us. You belong to me. Yes, the human culture may disrespect you, they may attack you, they may ignore you, and put you aside, but you belong to God. Then in chapter 8, things that might be confusing are the angels of, of the plagues. Seven angels. The signs of God to warn us to warn us. We're not going to get away with it. For evil, we're not going to get away with it. <laughs> if you're good, it's not because you got away with it, but because you did it my way, is what God is saying. You didn't do it your way. You didn't do it the human way, the humanized way, the defective way. In your circumstances, you try to do it my way. The angels of the plagues are the warnings of God to get attention to us. Attention to repent. Repent to do it the right way. So, they use different metaphors. Oh, the first angel comes balls of fire to destroy you what you have. You built up houses, you built up your castles, you build up your cities, you build up your nations, balls of fire will come and burn it on you. You'll be left alone. Will you be able to put out that fire? No. Apply it metaphorically to your life. Second angel will come. Rivers of molten rock. Volcanoes flowing away. Can you resist it? They're not rivers of, of water. They're not those for bathing or for enjoying. They're molten rock. You are be swept away. You're going to be swept away. Then you have polluted waters. Water is going to, the oceans and the rivers and all, they'll not be teeming with fish, they'll not be avenues of recreation or avenues of going from one nation to another. The water and the air will be polluted. Be able to breathe and gasp, you have plagues. You think you have a, a plague now, we have the viruses, we have the Spanish flu, we have Chinese flu, we have anyone, you can name anyone at all. If you look in history, in every hundred years at least, repeated over and over again, you get one epidemic after another. One thing that destroys people. If it's diphtheria, if it's smallpox, if it's measles, 
if it's polio, if it's tuberculosis, one after another, and we have to work against it and control it. We control one, we get another one. There, it's never ending. God is waking us up. We depend on him. We depend on medicine. We depend on his mercy. And we pray, Lord, deliver us. We're saying to all of them, Lord, deliver us. Deliver us from the medical plagues, from plagues of animals, of diseases, of mice, of fleas, whatever it is, from each other. We want to be with, and we want to be, and use things to our benefit, and we want to be protected from things that put us unsafe and in danger. Polluted oceans and human garbage from meteors, then ultimately from darkness, the stars and the moon and the sun will not shine. And then the, se the seventh plague is the trumpet of judgment. We have to give an accounting for what we do in life. But Glory to God. Glory to God. The Lamb of God appears. Everything is finally makes sense. In the end, in the end of the world, we come into divine recognition. When we are forgiven for our sins, we say, welcome into the kingdom. The Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Welcome into the kingdom. I make a new kingdom for you. A new light for you. The world, the sun and the stars are not important anymore. There'll be a new world. And all the things are now light. All diseases are gone. All happiness attains. Fear and confusion ends. And there are answers to all the questions that we ever have in life. We're safe. We're in God's glory. We're happy with each other. All those that are in heaven, all those that have done the will of God, all those that have gone the one way, the way of happiness, all these other things are put aside. So, my co-humans, co-Christians, co-seekers, and those that suffer, we're all in the same boat on this earth. We're all in the same situation. And that is what Revelation and Apocalypse are saying to us. Don't focus all on the disasters. They will end. They will not destroy the hand of God. You're safe in his hands. You are belted in on that sea. The boat will not sink. And if it sink, if he is there, you think he's sleeping, and say, Lord, we perish. Lord, don't you understand? You're sleeping on our ship. You're steering it. It's lost its rudder. No, it hasn't lost its rudder. It hasn't lost the captain. It hasn't lost God. You can, in a certain sense, throw God overboard in your life. You can say, I'll steer it and you don't know the way. You can say, I can sleep in a storm. God does not sleep. God knows what's happening on every side. He sees it. 
and he knows what the end will be. The end will be living with him in his family and in his glory. That's what we pray for each other. While we're here in life, let's follow the way of the Lord. Let's have concern and believe on his word and read his word and practice it and know what he suggests, what he commands, what he advises, and what he did and become again the imitation, the creation of God. We are made in his image and that's what we are to be in our destiny on earth, the time that we have, whatever it is, we're here to be Jesus' images to each other by bringing his image into ourselves. God bless you. Pray for each other, brother. You are brother and sister, whoever listens here, because that's what Jesus did for us. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.